welcome to the Monsters and Myths show, where we invite guests to come and share their stories about the barriers and obstacles that they have faced in trying to get things done, and hopefully also the magic required to overcome those. I met tonight's guest a couple of years ago, actually, at the European Business Awards in Warsaw, Poland, and he had traveled there from Portugal. I had gone there from London, but as is typical in events, the troublemakers and free thinkers and innovators all end up finding each other somewhere in the audience. And we found each other and shared lots of stories and uh, have carried on ever since then, actually. And we've done quite a few things together in between. Uh, and he describes himself as a technology leader that hates technology. So, Pedro, please, you now have to explain yourself to the audience. A technology leader that hates technology, you will probably be viewed as a monster by a lot of people just for that statement. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And first of all, thank you, Andrew, for the invitation. It's so good to meet you and to speak with you and learn from you again. I think we are building uh, a, a good friendship. And uh, it's all about this. It's about connecting people and learning from, from others. Uh, getting back to the, 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 the strong starting that is about hating technology. I would say not hating, but sometimes I use it. Uh, because what I believe is what we do is not about technology. It's about what we can do with it. It's about the solutions. It's about solving needs and not the based on the technology. Technology, it's, it's only the tool that we use to, to build the solutions that uh, everybody needs to, to live better, to live happier. And of course, to keep the world uh, and the earth uh, for the for the ones that will come in the future. So um, I always use use that uh, if you want key uh, and strong uh, sentence saying that I'm I'm the CTO, but I'll not speak about technology. I'll speak about solutions and about what we can do with it. And that's such a fantastic viewpoint to have. I mean, I've often said to people, innovation is not about technology. Innovation is about people. That's and you know, if you want to become more innovative, if you want to succeed in innovation, you have to start with people. And as you say, technology is just a tool. But at being a fellow innovator yourself, you've been very innovative, you've been involved in a lot of innovative projects. I know the stuff that you're working on at the moment is very innovative. You build innovation teams, you've brought innovation into companies. You must have experienced many monsters and myths. So let's dive in. What's your first one, a monster or a myth? I will start with a monster. Uh, because uh, we need to fight our monsters. And I think this one is, is something that I'm, sometimes I face and, um, and I can explain you. So the name for my monster, so I, I, I'm calling it, is the chicken egg. And basically it's the, the, the big question, who came first, the chicken or the egg? And uh, when we, as innovators, uh, we go and try to face a customer or someone that we want to inspire with our solutions, we say, this is great, this is something new, and uh, always come with this question that is so, what are the results? What, what, uh, what, uh, what did you have as a result uh, with this uh, technology or this solution that you are presenting? And I say, huh, come on. This is innovation, so I don't have any results. I, I, can, I cannot grant you that this will work perfectly and this uh, will help you to achieve your dreams. Uh, so I would say that this is a big challenge and a big monster behind the door, I would say, uh, because uh, as an innovator, you need to inspire and make others believe in your dreams and, of course, in your capability to, to build your dreams. But uh, I would say also most of the startups face this would say big monster that is what came first the chicken or the egg the results or the solution 
So, so and, people uh, are yeah. expecting you to be able to tell them exactly what result they're going to get before they actually will buy into the concept of the uh, yeah. of the innovation in the first place. Exactly. And I, so, how do you deal with this? Well, uh, what I've learned also during these years working with innovation is they uh, it's we need to to show more than a, a PowerPoint. Okay, we need to show more than the passion and the vision. And what I what I started to do, of course, with my teams and uh, with the companies that, where I worked, was basically when I went there, uh, probably on the second meeting, I was already bringing something working, okay? Uh, even if it's just like uh, when, when the, the first Tesla was presented, a Mercedes with, a, with some glue and some uh, things to, 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 to seem like a Tesla, sometimes what you need to do is to show the vision uh, on, a, on a way that people can feel and can sometimes try it. And uh, I would say that probably this is one of the best approaches that is basically bring a prototype, bring something that can, it doesn't need to be everything, doesn't need to, to show everything, doesn't need to be perfect, but needs to be something that will show the ones that are asking for the egg or the chicken, that this will work, this is something good, and this is something that will solve the problem. So something tangible, something that people exactly. can interact with, not just uh, the pretty pictures and the marketing. I'm sure we've all seen marketing storyboards with lovely things but i i agree with you there it needs to be something that somebody can really go wow and and it doesn't have to be expensive either i mean i i've i've been in places where we've built prototypes out of lego blocks i love playing with lego blocks where we've actually made something physical tangible when it's been an object and we've said, you know, yes, this is Lego, but this is what it would be like. And people go, oh, well, where will that go? And where will this go? And things like that. And and for uh, computer applications, it's easy nowadays. I mean, you can use so many different mock-up apps and things like that. So prototyping, doing a working prototype of a POC, that kind of a thing, that's that's the answer. That's the magic to be able to conquer that monster indeed i think is 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 exactly that and and then you need to bring more you need to bring the passion you need to bring the trust uh, because you'll not sell an innovation if you don't truly believe on what you're trying to to sell or to achieve so um yeah it's about uh, something tangible and then passion and belief i think is the the three great, uh, great ingredients to do the chicken and <laughs> to put the chicken on the oven. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's an absolutely brilliant start because that's got a real tangible uh, um, uh, advice and action that people can take. So give us number two. What's the next one? Yeah, this one is, is, I would say, more a myth than a monster. And this basically, I'm facing this. I'm working with uh, artificial intelligence, I would say, since the last eight years or something like that. Uh, and of course, uh, we are seeing more and more people afraid uh, uh, about AI. So I call it AI Armageddon. So it's <laughs> basically the end of the world triggered by AI. And um, yeah, sometimes it's, I would say, art uh, to, to break this myth um, because people believe that uh, if the computer is capable to learn and then uh, you will take the decisions, it will be faster, it will be better than us. So basically uh, they see it's not only about uh, sometimes their position, their work, it's also about the afraid of uh, having a machine uh, taking decisions and uh, basically uh, gaining some willingness to do uh, bad things to us. And um, I, I would say that this is quite common and especially from uh, organizations and companies and areas that are not coming from the IT or from the technology side uh, that uh, we see a lot this, this afraid. I, I remember that I was on a, on a event, a workshop about AI uh, with an with a, a, a organization of lawyers 
And when when the guy that was presenting started to say, yeah, so uh, with a, with a, a simple or a, 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 an AI capability, uh, a computer will be able to be much more accurate, uh, uh, helping to take the decision about if someone is guilty or not based on the rules, based on the historic information, based on the on the, the, the information that was gathered during the, the process. So, and the, the lawyers were, I would say, totally afraid of it. And this is a myth, I believe, that needs to be break as others just like that, the fear of the, the fire, the fear of the cars, the fear of the uh, nuclear uh, energy is something that uh, needs to be break, but also needs to be uh, properly managed, I would say. You, you mean to say that Skynet and Terminator are not things that are definitely going to come true in the future? I mean, you mean Hollywood's got it wrong? <laughs> well, we never know because we saw already a lot of things coming from Hollywood that now are, I would say, uh, reality. So we never know, but I think it's, it's our decision, it's our power, it's our responsibility to grant that uh, uh, as with the fire... Uh, we use the fire to to cook food and to do other things that are also good for us. With AI, we will be able to 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 as a humanity, if you want, we'll be able to take the the correct decisions to use AI to help us to use AI to help us to take decisions better informed, uh, and rather than uh, of course uh, help Skynet to flourish and then the robots attacking us and everything goes because i would say that we are quite good and we were quite good in the past to ruin our earth our planet so we don't need help from robots to do it uh, we do need help from robots probably to to heal the planet and ai can also help it and it is already helping it I, and I, I, your your example reminds me of a of a one of my favorite quotations which was is people do not fear the unknown they fear what they think they know about the unknown and ai for me is is exactly in that category because i've often like you i've often encountered this exact myth and now i've got a name for it ar mcgarden I'm going to have to figure out how to pronounce that one. I can figure out how to spell it, but yeah, AI beginning. Um, and and I've I've faced it in a number of industries. And and for example, I in a factory that I was doing a factory visit on a, a little while ago, where the 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 workers in the warehouse were terrified about AI. You know, AI robots doing the the picking of the um, of the the stock off the shelves and and deliveries and packing and everything like this. And they were all fearful of AI thinking that it's going to take their jobs. But if you look at the statistics in America, where I think it's UPS is one of the places that is has implemented a warehouse automation to a phenomenal degree. And they released statistics. It was either UPS or DHL. So apologies to whichever one it, it, it wasn't. Um, but they release statistics to say, not only have they not made any staff, laid off any staff because of automation and AI, they have actually hired extra staff and they have upskilled and retrained staff to be able to use. So, so they no longer, they're not replaced by the robots. They are now the bosses of the robots. So these are people that used to be unskilled laborers or semi-skilled laborers have now become far more greater skilled controlling the robots. And the reason why they had to expand their staff was their capacity on throughput went so enormously that they were able to, that they needed to hire more staff to do other types of, uh, of the handling process and things like that. So to me, opening people's eyes is the way to conquer this 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 myth but have you got any other ways of just helping to overcome this myth because it is a myth this is yeah. not i i i hope i i live to see the positive outcome of our application of ai and not the hollywood version you know well 
I wouldn't be living at all then because if the Hollywood version came true, we were all finished. Indeed, but uh, I would say two things. Um, first on the jobs, let's face it, there will be jobs that uh, we will not need it anymore. But this is something that is historic. Uh, uh, I spoke about cars. I think the first cars that uh, started to, to appear on the streets, there was one guy running in the front of the car uh, to, to, to uh, inform everybody that the car was passing. So again, technology is um, sometimes substituting or deprecating some types of jobs or responsibilities, but of course is opening um, other, other doors and um, creating other needs and other positions and other jobs. So again, uh, there will be impact, uh, but at the end, I truly believe that the impact, if we sum everything, the good and the bad, the, the impact should be and will be positive. At, and of course, it's our responsibility. The second thing that, uh, that I want to, to mention, uh, you were saying, ah, I don't want to see uh, the bad impact of AI. Well, I would say that some of the things that you, that you saw in the last years, just like elections and, and other things sometimes are also the result of AI used in the wrong way. So, but just like fire or just like other things, uh, if you use it in the wrong way, of course, it can generate wrong results. Um, but I truly believe, and uh, again, it's responsibility also uh, for everybody that is involved in the, um, in the technology world, uh, we need to grant and we need to to set the the basis and uh, and the guidelines uh, to grant that AI and the power of AI will be unleashed uh, for the positive things. And we see more and more uh, new things helping also uh, the world based on AI. So uh, I'm I'm also a very positive person. So uh, sometimes I only. Uh, I do prefer, and this is, I would say, by 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 scratch and by conviction. Uh, if I if I can face the good things and the bad things, um, I need to learn sometimes from the bad things. But I truly prefer to to see the positive way, to believe that everything can be improved, and of course, is not believe and then wait for it. I, I believe, and I I. I my work and my focus on helping that. So I truly believe that AI will help us, is already helping us, will help us much more in the future. Uh, and again, is our responsibility, uh, uh, especially the people that is working with technology, to grant that uh, the artificial intelligence will stay artificial, but of course will add a lot of intelligence to the one that we have, and um, basically to be a, a good advisor for us, for sure. So I believe there that the magic to be able to overcome this is to share the positive stories so that it's a positive future becomes the outcome because mm -hmm. that's the story that we share with people. Because I think the more the negative stories get shared, I think, a lot of people believe that the future is already something that's determined and we're just following down a path, but it's not. We are the ones who create the future and the future that we create will be a reflection of us. So if we're sharing only the negative stories, the future applications of AI will only be negative. So the magic is to share the positive and to bring that positivity and show people how the benefits can, can be applied and also then what we need to do in order to make sure that that is the future that comes out. Because I think one of the things that the negative stories give us, the um, <laughs> one thing that that myth does do is for a lot of us that paints a picture of exactly what we don't want to happen. So deep fakes, for example, we don't want deep fakes to be as, prevalent as they are now. Uh, so the negative helps us to come up with the parameters and rules that are acceptable, and then for us to put things in place to prevent that from happening. Because I think that's a lot of the, the negative that happens is things that people haven't thought of the, uh, of the consequences. It's the unintended consequences. Yeah, and uh, you, you said one thing that uh, I truly believe. 
that the future will be uh, the result of what we do and our decisions. And I would say also AI is also the 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 the, the image of what we will uh, teach AI to do. So uh, again, um, there are still uh, a lot of changes and grow and evolution on AI that you'll see for sure in the upcoming years. It's very very fast and it's uh, it's being very very fast. If we remember what were the capabilities five years ago and what we have now is is totally different. And we are in a, I would say, so much higher uh, level of capability using AI. Uh, but again, it will always be uh, something that is uh, our image, or at least is it will be led by us. So it's our responsibility. One thing that is already being pushed a lot is to grant the traceability, understand why the, the the machine is taking this decision. And what were the what was the algorithm or or what was the rules behind to to make the machine take this uh, this decision? So this is very important, especially for for AI decisions. But again, it's it's on us, and um, the future will be uh, what we as a as a group of people that is not only not only the technical guys, of course, and the technology guys, but everybody. The future will be the result of what we want to do. I would say, luckily, I'm seeing in the in the last months and years uh, a much bigger focus on sustainability, on uh, protecting the the environment, and this is something that uh, can help us because we were on a very, uh, I would say, wrong way. Uh, but I, I still believe that we still have time uh, to to fix it and to make things much better than what we have today. And things like COVID is, are basically also remind, reminding us that we are not the, the, in the top chain of the, of the, the world and uh, we, can, we, we don't control everything. So uh, we, we, we need to, to, to regain, I would say, some, uh, some respect and, and then focus on the things that we need to focus. And, and with COVID, um, the the vaccine couldn't have been created with help, without the help of AI. If we didn't have the AI that we've got today, we would never have come up with a vaccine in the speed at which it was done. So there's a positive application to, to close off that monster myth at the moment. Um, so am, am again. So what's your final, what's your third one, monster or myth? It's, it's a myth. And it's coming from the the early ages of the earth. You probably have heard about the, uh, the the Tower of Babel, and what I'm calling it is the City of Babel. And basically, uh, the Tower of Babel was basically when uh, everybody that was speaking the same language uh, created a big, big tower, and uh, they started to to basically to fight. And uh, the, the, the ruler of the world and of the, the destiny of everybody, basically, by magic, uh, made people speaking with different, uh, in different languages. And basically, they were not able to understand anymore. And then they split, and then they went for the, the four corners of the world. So uh, today, I think this myth is being applied to cities and smart cities. We are seeing more and more uh, smart cities being built as vertical buildings. So uh, each application as a vertical solution and incapable to take advantage of uh, distinct uh, knowledge and information that we are collecting from one application to the other. And I see more and more smart cities uh, or cities that want to be smart uh, going in this uh, path that is basically, yeah, I just want to do this. I will try this one, this vertical, uh, waste management, I'll build this one, and then I'll build this one to do uh, flood detection on a, on, a, on a city nearby the sea. And basically they are being, uh, I would say, um, almost uh, uh, put under hostages because basically they, they, when they start this type of verticals, uh, they, they just uh, get stuck to this uh, partner or this provider of service of hardware. And uh, as you know, this type of uh, uh, applications in cities are tended to, to, to be 
working for 10 years, 15 years. And uh, this is very, this is a very wrong way, I would say, because uh, they think that it's easier and it's more scalable to do this. But at the end, they'll be stuck and they'll be basically uh, obliged to use this. So um, I'm seeing this more and more as a, I'm working with smart cities uh, a lot. And I'm seeing this as a, something that uh, they believe that is the best approach, but I'm, I'm, I truly believe that is the, the wrong approach and the, the totally opposite way uh, that they should uh, follow. I, absolutely. I couldn't, I'm actually quite shocked that, that that sounds like computing of years ago where you had these siloed platforms and siloed solutions, whereas these days, everything talks a common language or at least can translate between each other so that's quite that's quite worrying that yeah. these concepts exist out there particularly in smart cities because there's a lot of benefit that that uh, um, they can get from leveraging the info from a flood detection system, a fire detection system, shot detection, waste management, traffic flow, um, lighting, energy, power, people movement, transportation, all of that, that should all be connected as one kind of super hive mind. That's the only way that you're going to get the benefit, surely, of that kind of a thing. And I'm quite horrified to, to learn. I did not know that that was a common thing in the smart city environment at the moment. Yeah, but and let me go a little bit, I would say, further on this. Uh, you were mentioning that, yes, they need to have a, an umbrella that will be able to connect and to collect this information. But even if they build it, and I'm seeing this happening also, even if they have a super platform on the top, on the cloud, where they can basically collect information from uh, the, the traffic and from the weather. But what happens in this case is, there is uh, such a big amount of data that then uh, sometimes it's very complex to do. So um, what I truly believe, and uh, we are already also seeing some uh, some companies uh, working on this, and uh, uh, me right now, I'm working at Shredder uh, on the smart city systems, and we are pushing for that, and we are seeing more companies also starting with this, and also some cities, and also right now, the European Union is also pushing for this, that is making these systems open and interoperable. It's, and it's not only on the cloud, it's basically from the, the city ground, they need to be open and interoperable. Just to grant that even, uh, I don't need to send information from the traffic sensor to the cloud and then have an engine on the cloud to send to the, the luminaire. Yeah, just put the, the lights on. If we can, and that right now we are building the technology to do that, if we can have this sensor speaking with a luminaire saying, yeah, it's a lot of traffic here, you should put the, the dimming level to 100% or to 90%, whatever. So this openness and interoperability at each level of the systems, I think is the, the way to move. And um, yeah, right now we see some cities, especially the big cities, pushing to this, uh, if you want, umbrella platforms in the cloud. But what we will need, and for sure the cities will need for the future, is a much more open and interoperable city, uh, systems, I would say, in each level, okay? On the, on the ground, so on the sensor side, on the communication level, and of course, having platforms, speaking with platforms in a, in a much more open and interoperable way. But it's, it's a challenge, okay? And uh, sometimes people say, ah, this is open. Uh, what about security? Of course, systems need to be secure. Systems need, uh, need to be built with a high level of security. As you know, imagine uh, billions and billions of sensors in a city. If they are not managed properly or, or if someone hijacks these sensors, it's a big challenge for the city. Uh, but if we, if we are able to build this, in, on on a if you want a matrix capability where sensors can speak with sensors, sensors can speak with uh, with devices with with the, the the light where I'm working right now. Uh, I truly believe that this is this is the way to even to ease the city to basically take decisions. Uh, right now I'm using this sensor. 
if tomorrow I want to use another one, I don't need to 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 change my my full solution. I ju I just need to send the change the sensor and connect a new one, and the platform and all the system will be capable to adapt to receive the information and to behave as it was behaving uh, previously with a with another sensor with another manufacturer. So the magic to overcome this myth is open collaborative platforms. Would that be the right kind of a thing? Open collaborative systems. So start from the ground up to work together to leverage each other's data and to be able to all talk the same language. And even they don't even they don't need to speak the same language. Uh, yeah, and we, uh, if we think today <clears throat> using AI, I can speak with a Chinese that I don't know, I don't understand any word, I would say, or a couple only. And if I have a capability to, in real time, have a, a translator that basically says, yeah, uh, the, he's speaking something, he's saying something for you. So they, he can speak their own language. What you need to have is a very uh, powerful uh, capability of real-time translation, of course, messages, information, uh, sentences, rules, alerts, whatever. But what we need to have is a, a, a real-time capability to translate, to transform, and to understand. So uh, yeah, open, collaborative, interoperable, and I would say uh, smart enough to understand any type of communication and any type of language. Fantastic. Uh, Pedro, we have hit time. We've just hit yeah. 32 minutes on here. Time flowers, huh? <laughs> um, so I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for coming on the show today. If people want to get hold of you, I'll put your contact details and show notes, get hold of you on LinkedIn, that type yep. of a thing, social media channels, and they can follow up, particularly follow you in terms of your work within smart cities and innovation, which I know you are working in all the time and coming up with some fabulous things. So I am looking forward to a brighter future, if you want to, if you'll accept the, the, the pun. Yeah, I accept it, totally accept it. Thank you for, for the invitation, for the opportunity. As you know, it's always a pleasure to meet you and to speak with you and to learn from you. And uh, I always say that uh, the, my, my, my signature on my mail is let's light up the world. And I think light is a good way to, to, to make things happen and to, to make things much more clear to everybody. So yeah, that's my, my mantra right now is to help the world to be, I would say better uh, and smarter and safer also. Thank you, Pedro. Thank Bye. You. Thank you.